Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt. We now turn to the 11th of the 24 poems in Inscriptions in Leaves of Grass. This one is simply called Beginners. And like the last uh, poem that we, that we messed with beginning my studies, we now are going to talk again about Genesis, about beginnings and beginners. And the idea that Whitman's going to play with in this poem that I think is significant for us as we begin our study of every poem in Leaves of Grass is we're always beginning. I mean, this idea is so central to T.S. Eliot that in Four Quartets, he's Coker. He begins with that line, in my beginning in is my end. In succession, houses rise and fall, crumble, are extended, removed, destroyed, and in their place, blah, blah, blah. This idea of we're always conscious of where we start. Why? Because everything is about those circles, as we learned in our study of Blake, right? Songs of innocence lead to songs of experience, which lead back to songs of innocence all over again. Now, our assumptions here, to go through them quickly, is that you're following our stuff at LearnStrong.net. Down the left-hand side there, find the Talks with Walt, as we're calling these series of talks. And we're hoping that you are familiar with the previous stories, because we are the stories we tell and retell. We are the stories we accept and sometimes decide to reject. And as beginners, we want to pay attention to the ways that we start with our stories. Our learning theory is another assumption. We're connecting new to old and meaningful in important ways, we hope. Um, we say the new is the new, the N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. We're always relearning what we have for somehow forgotten or somehow transformed it through our learning. Our annotative approach, of course, we ask three questions. Level one, what does the text say? Level two, what does the text mean? Two A, three uh, messages, themes, to be rhetoric and, and how the uh, construction, for example, look at the first word of every line of this poem. Anaphoria is what we'll call it. What the word how, over and over and over again. By the way, it makes sense if you're thinking about education. How, how, how. It's an interesting way to approach it at 2B. At level 3, we ask, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? First of all, to prior text. For example, as we've already said, beginning my studies leads naturally to a study of beginners, the poem we're looking at now. And most importantly, finally, at 3B, how can I relate this information to myself? This is a powerful, I think, way to try to learn through reading, to ask, can I own this information by somehow making it mine? Somehow, what it is that Whitman has to say challenges me and the way I think about my own life. We'll see if we can make that happen. We also assume, of course, a working familiarity with our big five. What does this text say about epistemology? What you can know, as we said in our previous lecture, that's huge if you're thinking about your education because as we learned from our study of Plato's Republic, you are your education, right? What you are exposed to, and as we've uh, said in those lectures, that education that exposure of information either happened intentionally by others or randomly. You just kind of stumbled onto things. Of course, as well, ontology, our second of our big five, who are you if you are your education? Like, what does that even mean? And then, of course, psychology, sociology, the next two of our big five. Finally, the theodicy question, why is there pain and suffering in this world? And how can I learn to ask why did this happen for me instead of why did this happen to me? Our five P's are our final assumption here. We're looking at Whitman from five perspectives, five P's. Whitman as person, Whitman as poet, Whitman as pedagogue or instructor, obviously that's huge for this one. Whitman as politician, obviously his passion for democracy, and then finally Whitman as philosopher and thinker. We're going to see some of that here as, as well, as the influences are not only from Socrates, but Emerson as well, with, a, with, with an essay like Self-Reliance, or obviously American Scholar, a text that we go back to and love, and we've given lectures on at LearnStrong as well. Now let's turn from our assumptions to the background information. Our uh, <clears throat> first appearance of this poem and the final revision of this poem is actually in 1860. Um, the, the, uh, it's, it is interesting um, to kind of hear this one. Uh, it is a distinguished little poem. I'm now working with, with Norton's. A distinguished little poem appearing in 1860. It does show Walt Whitman's power to withhold and challenge. Uh, the word beginners is to be taken in no obvious sense the beginners are the great innovators. Now, uh, we've already mentioned that Emerson, uh, affected by Carlyle in Self-Reliance and other essays, uh, the idea of the great man theory. That is to say, these innovators. What would the world be like if 
uh, Steve Jobs had never been born. What would the world be like if Rosa Parks had never been born? What would the world be like if, and we go on and on and on with this kind of question, right? That is to say, these great thinkers, these great doers, these innovators, these are the beginners, right? Now, we've already pointed out uh, the style of Whitman in Anaphoria already, but notice in this poem the repetition of the word how over and over again. I'm going to go to, um, to the great biography uh, by Paul Zwick uh, of Walt Whitman, The Making of a Poet, and I want to just share with you what for Zwick is such an important uh, element of Whitman early on. In his notebooks, Whitman, about his own style, made these observations to himself. Quote, Make no quotations and no references to any other writers. Why, why we won't see Emerson's name mentioned hardly at all, right? Lumber the writing with nothing. Let it go as lightly as a bird flies in the air or a fish swims in the sea. Now, much like reading defensive poetry, the famous Percy Bysshe Shelley essay that we talk about, we're going to ask, does Whitman actually pull these things off in his poetry? And many of these will say, yeah, he does. Watch this. Rules for composition. A perfectly transparent, plate glassy style, artless with no ornaments or attempts at ornaments for their own sake. They only looking well when they like the beauties of the person or character by nature and intuition and never lugged in to show off. Another one. Take no illustrations, whatever, from any ancients or classics. We have to laugh at some of this, right? Because the new is the new, as we've said. Make no mention or allusion to them, whatever, except as they relate to the new, present things. Another one, clearness, simplicity, no twistified or foggy sentences. And again, we'll, we'll play this one out with our uh, essay on, from Lyrical Ballads by Wordsworth, right? And some of those principles as we've given lectures on all of that. The most translucent clearness without variation. And then finally he finishes, common idioms and phrases, Yankeeisms and vulgarisms, can't expressions when very pat only. In other words, I want to make my stuff, as of course Wordsworth said when he was messing around with lyrical ballads, I want to make it something that anybody can read, accessible we might say, right? Anybody can read, anybody can understand. Well, notice again, we have the word how in every line here, all seven lines, right? The word how over and over again. Let's just enjoy the poem now. How they are provided for upon the earth, appearing at intervals, how dear and dreadful they are to the earth. How they inure to themselves as much as to any. What a paradox appears their age. How people respond to them, yet know them not. How there is something relentless in their fate all times. How all times mischoose the objects of their adulation and reward. And how the same inexorable price must still be paid for the same great purchase. Now, we're going we're to exegete this poem, but I want to point out right away at level 2B, not just the anaphoria of the how, 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 over and over again like a mantra, but notice the pronoun they. Beginners is the title of the poem. We assume that he's talking about these beginners, but what beginners? Which beginners? And obviously he's speaking now about genius. About those individuals, as we've said in our lectures, for example, about Shakespeare, Milton, Dante, Chaucer, all of those great writers, Margaret Atwood, they are the writers who somehow reach back in time, bring to the present, and then start to share ideas that will become understood only in the future. In their own lifetime often, these artists, these genius, are not fully appreciated or understood but only after the fact when we go, whoa, they were so far ahead of their time, it is quite amazing what they pulled off during their time. Sometimes, as we'll hear in this poem, against all odds, we might say. Notice, first of all, provided for, that's an interesting word. In other words, it's almost like they're a gift of a kind. We think about Kafka's hunger artist here as being a way to kind of compare the idea. Provided for upon the earth, appearing at intervals is said in parentheses. In other words, we don't get these kind of people all the time. Now, obviously, we got to recognize out loud, Whitman, like Dante the Pilgrim, wants to visit with the greatest poets of them all, Dante. And, oh, you're that great po poet, Dante. We obviously can read 
that Whitman is hoping that he might be considered one of these great innovators, one of these great beginners, we might say, right? And, of course, in the process of doing this, this is some pretty interesting rhetorical sleight of hand, we might say. Go back to our comments on Wordsworth's 1802 when he calls to Milton and says, man, we really need a, we really need a new Milton. Well, gee, I wonder who could be a new Milton. Maybe Wordsworth was himself hoping to be that guy. Notice how, notice your, your, your repetition of the D sounds here. How dear and dreadful they are to the earth. Notice the repetition of the word earth here. Earth here meaning not just the physical earth, but obviously the earth, the world of the mind, right? Notice they're dear. We love them. But they're also dreadful. Whitman's seeing both sides, as Blake would see, both sides of this kind of scary, almost horrifying reality that when you get new ideas, sometimes they're less enjoyable and they're more terrifying. How, line three, they inure. Now, this is a great word, right, to accustom someone to something, especially something unpleasant, right? If you inure someone, you're helping them to get over their apprehensions. How they inure to themselves as much as to many. Now, this will be huge, given what he's already said about He's trying to figure out, remember when I, uh, we worked with, when I read the book, he's trying to figure out for himself who he is and what his life is about. So, in other words, great innovators. They're much, as much about themselves as they are about anybody else. That tension between psychology and sociology, as we talk about it in our study, for example, of Ayn Rand and the ideas in Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged. The idea that, is it for you or is it for the rest of us that you are so driven? And, of course, it's some combination of the two, Whitman will argue, right? Notice the use of the dash, which makes us think about Emily Dickinson. What a paradox appears, their age. Now, notice the antecedent to the pronoun their, as in their age, is problematic, right? I mean, are we talking about their age as in how old they are, or their age as in the epoch that they live in, and why is it Shakespeare wasn't more celebrated during his lifetime. Well, maybe nobody fully appreciated just what it was that he was doing. It is very possible that uh, a, a filmmaker like Spielberg, genius Spielberg, will only really fully be appreciated in a thousand years when people look back and say, wow, look what he did for film. We say this, of course, about great actors like Daniel Day-Lewis, who Spielberg hooks up with in uh, his famous representation of Lincoln. We've commented on, on, on the power of a representation like that one as well. Notice the next one. How people respond to them, to this paradox that they are, right? And yet, know them not. Now, this is, of course, a key from our, when I read the book. That is to say, Whitman, if he's including himself as one of the great beginners, and obviously we know that he thought of himself as wanting to be that, people don't really understand who they are. Now, obviously, we think of Jesus Christ in an example like this. He came unto his own, his own received him not, blah, 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 the idea. Misunderstood right from the start. That inability to really comprehend and appreciate just what it is that's happening right in front of the people, right? People here... That word that starts to sound very Platonist, the demos, that is to say, normal people don't understand or appreciate. Now, obviously, this is important for Whitman as person because it's interesting how few people celebrated Whitman in his lifetime, especially after 1855 when he published Leaves of Grass. And people are like, oh, yeah, are you that guy that like writes? And, and even his own family members sometimes would disavow that, in fact, they were related to the guy who wrote those crazy poems. How... There is something relentless. This is almost like that inevitability factor, right? In their fate, all times. Here, fate obviously could mean destiny as well. In other words, they were born for something amazing and great. How all times mischoose the objects of their adulation and reward, right? In other words... Scooby Snacks are an illusion. And often, the people who are most celebrated don't end up as what Yeats will call in Sailing to Byzantium, monuments of amazing intellect. What will last? What will we be reading in 200 years from now? I think we'll still be reading the poetry of Walt Whitman. From our own time, what will we be reading, watching, listening to? It's an interesting question. We play with that one in Sailing to Byzantium. And, notice the word, and to qualify the last line, how... The same inexorable, we think of translinguistic, you cannot quite put words to what is going on. 
price must still be paid for the same great purchase. Now, I think the word price here is central. I think Beginners is a poem about choosing to pay the price. That is to say, to count the cost, as we sometimes will say it in, uh, in metaphysical kind of language. Before you take the journey, you want to think about are you prepared to take the journey? And we think of a, po of a, of a poem uh, 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 like Pilgrim's Progress to come to play with this, uh, this idea, right? The price one must pay if one is going to be an innovator, the, the great beginner of some kind of idea. Well, let's finish now at 2A. Obviously, we live in many ways through the genius of those who came before. That's clearly one of the arguments here. Great thinkers, right, are usually misunderstood in their own time. And then obviously there's an important price to pay that one must be willing to pay. I mean, we think about, for example, somebody like Miles Davis, and, I mean, there it is, right? The price that has to be paid for the greatness that will be, of course, his music. At 2B, we've already seen this anaphoria thing. Um, why do this is the question, right? All seven lines will play this game of how, 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 how. It's quite, a, it's quite an interesting way to write poetry, and we're going to see it again and again. This will be the first time that it's used in this way over and over again. Um, let's jump now to 3A. Um, Sir Isaac Newton said in 1675, quote, If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, end quote. And obviously we're playing a very similar kind of game here. Emerson's great man theory that he borrowed from Carlyle as referenced in self-reliance comes to mind. Think about all, and now it's 3A, 3B, think about all the great giants. If we are the stories we tell and retell, what, who are those storytellers for us? Obviously in 303 we celebrate Homer and Virgil, Obviously, the great playwrights of Sophocles, Euripides, no question. Plato, Aristotle, obviously. We have our Chaucer, our Shakespeare, our Milton, our Dante, our Cervantes, T.S. Eliot. Who are the other thinkers for you that have been greatest? Who are the giants on whom you stand, the shoulders on, 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 on those giants that you stand on to be able to see and understand the world? Maybe Whitman, for you, will become one of those, especially through this study, right? And... How about this one? There was a time when you had to pay the price for the advancement. I mean, some of you will say going through these poems is a sacrifice of time, energy, the price that one must pay. I hope that it's a price worth our time. Thank you. I hope you'll return for more talks with Walt.